Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In the diagnosis of conditions of the head and neck, auscultation usually does not play a prominent part. Occasionally we'll use it to listen to the temporomandibular joint, but on some uh, unusual circumstances it may be quite helpful, and we'd like to demonstrate that today. We have with us uh, Mrs. Bayshore, uh, who is some 30 years of age, and Mrs. Bayshore has had a problem for about the last uh, six months. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was hearing my pulse um, through all my activities during the day, and it just seemed to be constant. It was with me all the time, mm -hmm. and it, when I was uh, quiet, it would increase in sound. And along with this, I was having short periods of being lightheaded, perhaps maybe three to five seconds, maybe three times a day. Mm -hmm. and you never lost consciousness with no. that, but just felt lightheaded? Yes. Did uh, you change uh, your position, sit down or lie down, or not no. particularly? And those would just be transient, they'd only last for a short period of time? Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you saw uh, fit to see someone about that in uh, the fall? Yes, I did. I was recommended to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Mm -hmm. And he had done some ear testing, and he was concerned about the sound he heard in my neck. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I was entered into Sparrow as an outpatient and one brain scan was done. And then from Dr. Holmes, I went to see Dr. Jakubiak, the neurosurgeon in Lansing. And they, This was uh, then a couple of months ago? This was the middle part of October. Mm -hmm. And that's when you had your surgical procedure? Towards the end of the month. Yeah, yes. We will get into a discussion of, of that, perhaps with the help of the arteriograms uh, a bit later. Uh, but uh, for the present time, we can merely indicate that uh, Mrs. Bayshore had an external carotid ligation in November. And uh, again, that took away some of the uh, mass. Did you feel something under your neck uh, before that or not? I could feel it, it jumping out, yes. and I could see it when I was looking at myself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. But during the operation that was done just under, under local anesthetic, the sounding stopped right there, uh, and it, it was just really good to, to hear no, no noise. There was an appreciable change in that noise. Then uh, after that procedure, subsequently, that was about two months ago, have you had any other changes? Has the noise come back or the uh, lightheadedness? About two weeks after the surgery, the noise started back in, but it, it was quieter, and it was just at different types of the day. It didn't it wasn't constant as before, and the level was down. But also during that time, the feeling of being lightheaded has increased. And within the last three weeks, it's increased tremendously. It's coming perhaps seven or eight times a day. Lasting still, there's, there are some times, it's still maybe five seconds. But I've also had several spells lasting from one hour into three hours. Mm -hmm. And it's when I'm, I'm sitting erect or possibly even standing for maybe an hour, hour or two. It's That's not from... It bother you more. Yes. I've also had it when I was lying down hmm. for some time. So it's not only when you're standing that uh, the no. weakness seems to come on. No. Well, for purposes uh, of demonstrating the auscultation of uh, a vascular anomaly in this uh, head and neck region, we would like to utilize a stethoscope uh, and uh, listen to uh, this side of the face where ordinarily one does not hear uh, any appreciable sounds other than the normal pulse. But if we place this stethoscope uh, in the pre preauricular region just lateral to the ascending ramus of the mandible, and uh, we'll now listen to what we hear here. The 
quality of uh, that brewery uh, is uh, what we would like you to appreciate. Between the normal heart sounds, there is a gush uh, that is sort of overriding uh, the entire uh, sound series, and it represents the communication between the arterial side and the venous side uh, through a fistula. Uh, we will uh, again make an effort to uh, listen to this and uh, now we will In order to uh, make comparisons, which always must be done, we will see at the same volume level in amplification what the contralateral side may reveal. That should have demonstrated a uh, heart sound uh, propagation uh, through the external carotid system on the left, but what you did not hear is what we picked up on the right side in the form of a brewery, uh, this gush uh, situation. Now, uh, that is, if I listen further along the course of the inferior alveolar artery, I can hear the propagation of that uh, brewery all the way across the midline and also up into the superficial temporal area. Now if we look at the side of Mrs. Bayshore's uh, neck here, we will see the incision which several months ago was utilized to gain access to the carotid sheath in the ligation of the external carotid. And it was in this area that she previously had the pulsatile mass, which again we'll be able to appreciate in a moment in the radiographs. We certainly want to thank uh, Mrs. Bayshore for helping us today in demonstrating uh, this physical sign of auscultation of the head and neck region. Thank you. You're welcome. This is a panoramic survey film called a panorex uh, type of view of Mrs. Bayshore. It indicates uh, that the jaws uh, here have been more or less laid out in uh, a profile fashion and the projection is particularly good for pathology in the ramus area. If we look to the side in question, which is her right, we see a lytic lesion. It is located in this mid portion of the ramus. It has a uh, border that is fairly regular and its association with the inferior alveolar nerve and canal, which comes down in this fashion, finds perhaps a communication and a canal that is about twice to three times the normal side. For basis of comparison, we can turn to the other side where we see <clears throat> there is no radiolucency. The mandibular foramen is at about this point and this is the outline of the normal canal. So if we return to this lytic lesion, the differential diagnosis here could include many things, uh, but it, as we will see in some other films, when associated with the pulsatile mass that was noted below the inferior border of the mandible at the angle region, uh, and uh, some of the studies that you will now see as the arteriography series, it'll be quite clear that this represents a lytic lesion from destruction of bone that is associated with a vascular abnormality. We'll next uh, look at the arteriogram series. This is a carotid arteriogram. The catheter has been inserted to this level this is the tip of the catheter, and it therefore represents the takeoff point 
uh, into the maxillary artery as part of the external carotid series. Uh, this uh, projection has been magnet, uh, magnified to twice normal size, and that is why it appears large. It is at this point, then, that the contrast media is introduced to the vascular structures uh, that are distal to it. And we'll see the pattern, then, of this contrast study. At this point in the study, the carotid is shown along with its tributaries, this uh, being the uh, internal carotid and the external carotid series. One sees that instead of a normal sized maxillary artery, there is a very huge coiled anomalous structure here that winds itself around and eventually insinuates into this uh, coil into the bone defect on the medial surface of the mandible. Other carotid branches uh, are the facial artery, the lingual artery. We don't see the superior thyroid, but we see the bifurcation at this lower point. Up here then we have ordinarily the size of the maxillary artery, uh, even in this uh, magnified series. Uh, should be uh, less than the diameter of this vessel. All of these vessels are enlarged, and of course this is the huge anomalous structure, and it is at that point that it communicates uh, with a direct uh, fistula uh, to the uh, internal jugular with a rapid outflow series. Now when one has an arteriovenous uh, fistula, it attracts blood from many sources as we'll see in a subsequent film. This is a correlated study in which the vertebral artery is the one perfused with the radiopaque dye. And we see the course of the vertebral artery up in this situation and entering to becoming the basilar and the cerebellar region and being distributed as part of the intracranial circle of Willis perfusion. Uh, down here, there's a communication through a series of branches, again, into this vast anomaly that fills the infratemporal fossa, and one again sees the outline. It's not filled with quite as much contrast media at this point, but you can see how it is pulling off or siphoning off uh, a supply from the vertebral uh, into this uh, external carotid system. Similar studies in later time phases showed that there is also a tendency to steal blood supply from the internal carotid through many branches coming down through the base of the skull. This final sample of the series uh, is a reversal film in which there has been a uh, uh, camouflaging of the contrast uh, of normal structures and it uh, tends to amplify the contrast of what changed between the two projections. So with superimposition uh, we see with a reversal film superimposed upon the original we see in this reversal that the structures that ordinarily uh, were white are now dark as you see in the, in the contest of the bone, uh, and so th the things are reversed, and therefore the contrast media, instead of being white, is now dark. Uh, this tends to sharpen up the uh, outline of the contrast study, and in it we begin to get some appreciation uh, in this PA view of the skull, in this carotid uh, arteriogram that is reversed, uh, we see the huge size of this vascular sac that is completely filling the infratemporal fossa. Uh, we see perhaps a normal branch uh, of this maxillary artery coming up uh, as, uh, again, uh, the middle meningeal coming out this way, and uh, it represents a totally uh, anomalous and uh, huge vascular structure. 
So these studies have indicated a uh, probably a congenital uh, vascular anomaly that perhaps has been increased in size uh, with an increased aperture of the arterial venous shunt within it. Uh, with the help of these studies, one has a better appreciation then for the magnitude of this vascular abnormality. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.